Brendan paused at the end of the lane. He could smell it even before reaching Jeremiah's farm. It was the smell of decomposing potato plants, sending out the most evil stench he'd ever encountered. Brendan covered his mouth with his cape, gagging nevertheless as he went, passing field upon field of dead black slime that he knew would have until recently contained ripe green plants with potatoes ready for digging. He ventured on to his cousin's farm. In a dim, he whistled through clenched teeth. He'd never witnessed such desolation. Reaching the end of the lane, Brendan dropped out of the saddle and tied the horse to the post. He looked around, wondering where the sheep and horses had gone. The place was unervingly quiet. His worst fears had been confirmed. Brendan's stomach churned forcefully, and it wasn't just the smell of the potatoes that was causing it. Lifting the latch of the cabin door, filled with trepidation, Brendan walked in. He stopped dead in his tracks. What he saw was both eerie and heart-wrenching. The room was silent, despite the fact that he could see the family. In the corner, the children huddled lethargically round the hearth, reluctant to move away from the dying embers. It was warm outside, but with little or no food inside them, they were feeling nothing but cold. Nobody took any notice of Brendan. Jeremiah was hunched over the table, head in hands, and Anya was silently washing the same dish over and over again as she stared with unseeing eyes out of the tiny window above her bowl. Moving over to his cousin, Brendan rested his hand on Jeremiah's shoulder. Jeremiah, Brendan whispered gently. His best friend as well as cousin, the big man who feared nothing or nobody, didn't respond, stilled as he was by defeat. Brendan stared incredulously. Looking back at the children, he noticed that little Honora and her brother John were missing. He would learn later that they'd already died from pneumonia and the typhus, as had Anya's mother and father. Eventually, Jeremiah raised his head and looked up, his eyes lifeless and glazed. It took him a while to recognise his cousin. He frowned and then rose slowly to his feet. Brendan, is it really you? The two men exchanged the weakest of greetings and then fatigued by the effort, Jeremiah dropped back into his seat. Brendan slipped into the chair next to him. Jeremiah, what in God's name, he asked quietly. I can't believe it. Jeremiah stared at the table in front of him. Out of nowhere. It was as if he was talking to himself. No warning, nothing. The crops wiped out. Overnight, all that work, gone. We've got nothing left to pay the rent. Already gone through last year's potatoes. Jeremiah sighed and then took a laboured breath. Anya's been cooking them with seaweed to eke out what's left. It's down to her that we're still alive. He looked up at Brendan wearing the mask of defeat. But it's only a matter of time before we'd be turned out of the cottage. Torched out, probably. Brendan heard a stifled sob from Anya as she turned the same dish round again in the water. He looked over in alarm. There was nothing left of her. Turning back to his cousin, he shook his head in denial. This couldn't be happening. Jumping up from the table, he paced the floor, looking for answers. Overcome with outrage and protectiveness, eyes blazing with anger, he shouted to no one in particular, No, no, they're not taking you. I won't let them. Who they were was anybody's guess. Grabbing Jeremiah by the shoulders, Brendan recoiled when he felt nothing but bone under his fingertips. Looking his cousin in the eye, he affirmed, We're going to get through this, Jeremiah.
together, whatever it takes, we will do it, he said, emphasising every word. Jeremiah just stared back, disbelief written all over his face. Jeremiah was the fourth generation tenant farmer to work his land. Countless Fitzgeralds had been born in his cottage, and countless, no doubt, had died in it. In the past few weeks, Jeremiah had come to wonder if they would be the next and final family to die under its roof. Each mealtime had become more of a challenge than the last. He was fighting hard to keep his family from starvation, but even he had to concede that the battle was all but lost. He couldn't help but see the irony. Where the French had failed, the blight had succeeded. All around them the farms were going under. Landowners quick to throw the tenants out when they couldn't pay the rent. With nowhere to go, their occupants' journey from begging in the street to premature death was a short one. Jeremiah shuddered at the memory of his son John and little Honora. Might they have survived if they'd been better nourished? Jeremiah would often torture himself with such thoughts. Both he and Anya had tried so hard to work through their troubles, but with no food left to feed the family, all seemed lost. Now, here he was, Brendan, in their hour of need. What greater loyalty had any man? Jeremiah loved him all the more for it. As the two men regarded one another, each lost in their own thoughts, it was Brendan's turn to face reality. The scale of the disaster finally impacted on him, leaving him ashamed of his own complacency. He'd assumed that his friends and family would always be here whenever he returned. Now seeing the level of deprivation afflicting not just his cousin but most of the town, Brendan realised that the good times were over, forever. It was as if the Lord himself was punishing them all for some crime they didn't even know they'd committed. Perhaps in time they'd understand, but as he saw it, there was no way back. If they were to have any chance of survival, he must get his cousin and the family away from here. But first, they needed food. Opening his bags, he spread the contents out on the table. Anya stopped her washing and came over to join her husband. Both she and Jeremiah stared in disbelief at foods they could only have dreamt of, let alone eaten. Brendan resumed his pacing of the floor as he formulated plans. Turning mid-stride, he suggested to Jeremiah that the children be fed first, as a matter of urgency. Casting a sideways glance at them, he wondered what they had left in the way of reserves for what lay ahead. But what was the alternative? After the children had been fed, they must sit down and thrash out a plan. Muttering more to himself than anyone else, he reminded Jeremiah that his neighbours had left it too late. Stopping only to bang his fist on the table to emphasise his passion, Brendan kept repeating that he would not stand by and watch his cousin do the same. With the children away to their bunks, happier than Jeremiah had seen them in a very long time, the two men settled back to discuss what was to be done. Brendan began outlining his plans. Jeremiah, I know you and Anya don't want to leave the farm, but there's no alternative. It's no use you all ending up six foot under now, is it? No good waiting for things to turn round and get better, he insisted. They're not going to. The landlords will see to that. They've been rubbing their hands with glee, been handed a golden opportunity to claim back their land. All they're interested in now is planting new crops that they can sell onto the English market and make more money. Jeremiah stared at his cousin as if none of this had occurred to him before. Brendan delivered his verdict that they had only one choice open to them. We must get you away from here before it's too late. Move over to England. I know my way round. I can find work for you all. 
There's plenty of jobs going in the mill towns. It's your only choice. Jeremiah, trust me. Brendan could tell that Jeremiah was struggling to concentrate. No doubt a symptom of malnutrition. Brendan shot a pleading look across to Anya for support. He stared at the once beautiful woman that he'd first met on the day she'd married his cousin. Now she was so painfully thin and tired, as if each minute movement took all her strength. His heart went out to them both. All he wanted was to make things right for them, right now. But his head knew there was work to be done, and fast. Slowly it began to get through to Jeremiah that his cousin was talking sense. But it didn't make the listening any more palatable. He knew for certain that once they left Gulladu, they would never return. He felt as if he were betraying his legacy and everything he'd promised his Anya. But what other choice had they, he argued to himself. Anya turned back to her washing, listening, intent, listening intently as Brendan outlined the kind of work available in the mills. Workers, he went on, are also needed on the railways. The canals are also being developed in a big way. Labourers are needed to widen the ditches to link up with the waterways. Even farms are looking for labourers to mend walls and harvest crops. But it might prove harder to find somewhere to live, and that's a necessity, not an option. Probably best to head for the mills. Concerned at Jeremiah's lack of concentration, Brendan wasn't sure if he was talking to himself. He prayed that Anya was taking it all in. Nevertheless, he pressed Jeremiah for his assurance that he wouldn't back down if he put arrangements in hand. Jeremiah nodded his agreement. Anya ceased her washing and looked up from the bowl, gazed out of the makeshift window, the only one in their cabin. On the windowsill, a desolate sprig of lavender stuck out of a, more, a small clay pot. Anya's love of lavender dated back to the day she'd married her Jeremiah, bringing back, as it did, happy memories of her wedding bouquet. From that day forward, she'd never stopped growing it. Having rid the plant of any moisture, she would stuff patchwork cushions with the flower buds. Any surplus flowers would be soaked in oil and then drained, adding more fresh flowers to the oil and then drained again. And this process repeated until Arnie was happy with the strength of perfume. She used the oil to polish their few bits of furniture. In the summertime, the cottage was filled with the aroma of lavender. In winter, the burning candles that Arnie had made by melting old wax and adding a little of her oil regenerated images of the summer as they huddled around the fire in the half-light planning for the year ahead. Recent events, however, had made the cultivation of lavender a very low priority. Along with Jeremiah, they had harnessed all their energies into trying to find enough food to feed the family. When Honora and John had been taken sick, it looked as if the whole family might be wiped out, none of them having much left in the way of reserves to fight illness. Anya's parents, who'd helped as much as they could, sharing their own meagre supplies of food with the family, not to mention combing the seashore for seaweed to cook with the last of the potatoes, were themselves brought down by the typhus. In the space of two weeks, four of Anya's family had been taken from her. How the rest of them survived was both a mystery and a miracle. Studying the view from the window, Anya could hardly believe they were living in the same world. Outside in the warmth of the evening sun, fields covered in clover and buttercups portrayed a countryside rich in fauna and flora, with fields rolling one into another as far as the eye could see. The hedgerows and trees were filled with a happy birdsong of starlings and thrushes settling down for the night. But she knew that a destructive force lay beyond, the likes of which they'd never experienced. A visitation on biblical proportions that had wiped out their livelihoods in one stroke. The heavy rains in recent weeks had been bad enough curse, putting back as it did the harvest. 
but it was that evil smell that first alerted the farmers to what was to become their death knoll. Nobody was prepared. They were forced to stand by and watch helplessly. It all seemed such a lifetime away from the day that her mother had brought her over to the farm for the first time. Mrs Fitzgerald, Jeremiah's mother, had been very ill. And Anya's mother, being a good neighbour, announced that she would take a basket of oat cakes and pies over as a gesture of friendship. Anya had heard her parents talk about the Fitzgeralds many a time and being curious to see what they looked like, begged her mother to let her go with her. It would take them a good while to walk the distance, the farm being a few miles from their own. So they set off after breakfast before the sun's heat could slow them down. It was pleasant enough travelling through the hedgerows of summer. Anya gathered wildflowers as they went. The two women, easy in one another's company, chatted about the forthcoming dance to be held in the village hall at the end of the harvest. It was a rare event for work to cease and pleasure to begin. So it was hardly surprising that it was one of the major highlights on the village calendar. Music and dancing, fuelled by potine and ale, went on well into the night, until, like a set of skittles, the revellers fell one by one, only the strongest of the strong remaining until the sun broke cover. Deep in thought, Anya had been silent for some time, and she turned to her mother. Ma, I'll be needing a new dress for the dance. My old one is far too small now. Would that be right now, her mother teased. And there was me thinking I'd just let the hem down a little. Anya was about to complain loudly when glancing across, she saw her mother smiling. You and your joshing, Ma, you know you'll make me another. You're so clever with a needle, so you are. Anya knew a little flattery never harmed her cause. Mrs Ahern laughed. Anya Ahern, you are a little imp. Don't you be thinking I'm not knowing what you're up to. We'll see what we can come up with when we get back, she added mysteriously. They arrived at the farm just as the sun had risen to its full height. The Fitzgerald's cottage stood at the end of a narrow lane, embedded with mud and stones. As they made their way up to the top, Anya took in the view of fields of luscious green potato plants, Irish gold on either side, almost ready for digging. Picking their way along the lane made for agonising progress. The sharp stones being hard on the feet. Their shoes were no match for the flint sticking out of the mud, just waiting to catch the unprotected heel. The Fitzgerald's cottage was, like most of the tenant farmers' cottages, made of clay under a thatch roof. The roof was covered by a large net with weights hanging down either side to discourage the theft of twigs by nesting birds. Earlier generations of Fitzgeralds had built, as had most of their farming neighbours, the one-room cottage, or cabin as it was more commonly known, with their own bare hands, even though they knew that it would never be theirs and that it could be taken from them at any time by the landlord, who owned the rights to both their land and their home. Redmond Fitzgerald had taken it upon himself to build a small lobby in the centre of the room, thus turning the cabin into two large and one very small room in the centre. His neighbours, seeing the advantage, were quick to follow. Now, for the first time, they could enjoy the privacy of a living as well as a separate sleeping area. Families, almost always large in size at night, squeezed into the sleeping area where wooden cots or bunks would house the children, while the parents enjoyed the benefit of a horsehair mattress, the smell of which gave off the air of a stable. The lucky ones had a solid wooden frame in which to house the mattress. The numbers in most families ebbed and flowed as disease and sickness took their toll, and it wasn't uncommon to find just three or four healthy offspring surviving into adulthood. Anya was relieved when the lane ended. 
rubbing her bruised ankles they crossed the yard, sending up a shower of protesting hens and ducks. A plough, recently used, judging by the fresh mud caked round the wheels, blocked their path. Negotiating their way round the side of the machine, they reached the door, which had been left open to allow some fresh air into the unlit rooms inside. Hello, hello there. Peering in, Anya's mother called out. Anybody there? Eyes not yet accustomed to the darkness, were unable at first to make out the shape of Redmond Fitzgerald. A man's voice urged them to come in. With a solitary candle as the only source of light, the window being at the far end of the cabin, it was difficult to see in front of them. But once their eyes had adjusted, they could just make out the shape of Mrs Fitzgerald, propped up on a wooden seat, a frail wisp of a woman. She was painstakingly being fed milk, drop by drop, by her husband. Jenny Fitzgerald being too weak to hold the cup herself. It was obvious the poor woman hadn't got long to live. Anya's mother was shocked at the speed of her neighbour's deterioration. It couldn't have been more than a month or so since they'd last met. She knew then that the woman was ill, but to what extent had been hard to gauge. In reverential tone she offered their greetings and handed over the basket of food to Redmond. He seemed so grateful for such a small gift. While the two exchanged pleasantries and caught up on all the news, Anya studied the frugal contents of the room. Just a few old sticks of furniture and a patchwork quilt turned back on a bench. Although it was the middle of summer, Arnie could feel the insufferable heat from the hearth at the back of the cabin. Being there any means of cooking and heating water, occupants were forced to endure the heat and stifling smell of burning peat, even during the hottest of the summer months. Arnie wondered as she looked back at Redmond Fitzgerald whether he had many visitors. He seemed quite lonely, caught up in the half-light with only his invalid wife for company. As if reading her mind, Redmond Fitzgerald turned to Arnie's mother. Jeremiah's out in the fields, he explained quietly, and the other two have taken the milk to market. He looked at Anya and smiled broadly. When he smiled, Anya caught a glip, glimpse of what must have been a very handsome face in its youth. His thinning grey hair framed a leathery brown face, from out of which milky blue eyes met hers. She smiled back shyly. Redmond Fitzgerald made polite conversation, asking Anya's mother how their own farm was doing. But they were constantly interrupted by the cries of pain from Jenny Fitzgerald. Redmond kept patting his wife's hand reassuringly. Be all right, love, I'm here. Now you try and get some sleep. Feeling they were intruding upon private grief, Anya's mother made their excuses to leave. We won't be keeping you. If there's anything we can do, though, please do let us know. She rose to leave. Anya here would be only too happy to help out if you need any cooking or washing done. She nodded in Anya's direction, who, taking her cue, shook her head vigorously. Feeling the intensity of caring in the room, Anya had no hesitation in wanting to be a part of it. She thought she saw tears in Redmond Fitzgerald's eyes as he thanked them for their kindness. But he looked away so quickly she couldn't be sure. They were heading for the door when it burst open and Anya's jaw dropped as she came face to face with the most handsome creature she had ever set eyes on. His tall frame filled the doorway. White calico shirt sleeves rolled up to the elbows, revealed muscular tanned arms, brush stroked with drunk, strong dark hair. He fixed his gaze on Anya as his father spoke. Jeremiah, you're back. Edmund greeted his eldest son with affection. Anya couldn't take her eyes off him. Jeremiah, she mouthed silently. As if in response, he smiled back at her. You must be Anya. I seem to remember your mother talking about you last time she came over. Jeremiah extended his hand to Anya who blushed furiously, which seemed to amuse him. 
she stared into the dark brown eyes that were studying her, so warm and full of kindness that they left her in a state of confusion. His strong oval face was framed by a mass of dark brown wavy hair that drifted down his temples to a neatly trimmed beard. When he smiled, his generously wide mouth revealed large white teeth, some of which were less than straight, but did nothing but add character. The two shook hands, neither rushing to release their hold. Jeremiah found himself a willing captive. He reasoned that she couldn't have been more than about 17, but she had the elegance of a much older woman. There was, however, nothing old about her appearance. Luxuriant black hair parted down the middle, swept back of her face and piled high into a knot on the top of her crown. Flashing blue eyes danced expectantly over the top of a dainty freckled nose, set in a pixie-shaped face. Jeremiah noticed a locket hanging round her slender neck and for a moment frowned. Perhaps she was already spoken for. That such an idea should trouble him took him aback. Have you eaten? Jeremiah still had hold of Anya's hand. We were just about to leave, her mother explained quickly. You must have some lunch before you go. It's a long walk back. I could be taking you back in the cart, he offered helpfully. That's very kind of you, but I'm sure you have a great many things to do here. But we will take you up on your kind offer of some lunch. As you say, it is quite a walk back. While Mrs Ahern carried on her fragmented conversation with Redman, Jeremiah set about setting the table with food. Anya, offering to help, found herself in close proximity with Jeremiah as they went about their tasks. Often bumping into one another, Anya unsure of which way she should be turning, they would find themselves in fits of laughter. The sound caught Redman's, Redman's ear, causing him more pleasure than he thought possible. That was the first time Anya recalled that she'd set foot in the cottage. Mrs Fitzgerald, as expected, died soon afterwards. A broken-hearted Redman followed within the year, by which time Anya and Jeremiah had become engaged to be married. Until they found wives of their own, the two younger brothers continued to farm the land with Jeremiah. By the time Ellen and Mary arrived, Jeremiah and Anya had become the sole occupants. With Michael Maloney from the village and cousin Brendan, when he saw fit to return to his homeland, as their only other source of help. With each year, their family had increased until they numbered nine in total. That was until they'd lost John and little Honora to the typhus. So much history inside these four walls. Anya reflected as she wiped her hands on her apron. She turned and studied the two men seated at the table. Her strong, indestructible Jeremiah looked a beaten man. The contrast with Brendan could not have been more stark. Brendan was full of vitality and plans for the future. He looked up and caught her eye and gave her a smile that would have swept her off her feet had she not been wedded to her Jeremiah. Brendan was delighted to see a flush of colour appear across the tops of her cheeks. Reaching into his pocket, he pulled out a fistful of coins. I know food is hard to come by, but this should help until it's time to set sail. I'll be away first thing in the morning. I can see there's not a moment to lose.